So good afternoon. There's lots of people I've never seen before. And a few people on Zoom also. Hello, Sheila, I think I see you. Can you make it bigger that I can see who is here? Yeah, it's hyper, the whole thing. Oh, yeah, there's Sheila, hi. And Suzanne, hi, and Johnny, who is coming very, this is the kind of people I know already. So you have also been on the New Year's retreat. Yeah. And is that, is that everything good now? Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> yes, you, you make your announcements. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, hi, everybody. <laughs> Welcome to the San Francisco Dharma Collective. I'm Karen. I'm the volunteer. Thank you all for coming. Um, as many of you know, we run on Donna, which is the practice of generosity. So your generosity helps our teachers. It helps keep the lights on. Um, it helps pay our bills. Um, it's all volunteer run and all based on generosity at this time. So we do have a suggested donation, you know, anywhere from 10 to $30, depending, you know, where you fall and where you feel comfortable and no one's ever turned away for lack of funds. Um, we're happy to have you here. And for announcements, I couldn't uh, get the newsletter pulled up. Um, I don't think we have too many new programs coming up next week. So it's all of our regular programming. So go to our website and check out the calendar. And um, we take various forms of payment, Venmo, PayPal. And we have this little sum up machine over there for cards that you can just put a card to and uh, hopefully easily walk out the door. It shouldn't take long. And we also have cash in that big wooden box. You can also donate by cash. And um, we're always looking for volunteers. There's a volunteer sign up over there. And I think that's about it. Thank you for being here. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah. Okay. Yes, you all thank set? You. Yeah. Okay. All right. And if, you, if we're doing questions or answers, um, you can come up here and grab this mic during that time. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So maybe, uh, you know, today I start with introducing myself a little bit because there's quite a few people here I've never seen seen and they might have never seen me before so my name is is Santa Chita Picuni and I'm a nun since about 30 years and I'm born in Austria and then you know, I started in the what's called the Thai forest tradition many years ago in Thailand and then came to England and trained with Archon Sumedo and the Sila Dara Sangha in Amaravati and Chithurst for about 17 years before coming here to America. Uh, we were invited to try you know, to set up a training monastery for nuns. And, and we tried to do that, but it hasn't really worked out. And, and recently we have decided you know, to um, leave that monastery. And that was in the Sierra foothills about an hour away from Sacramento and to close it and uh, start again, because number one is, you know, there were lots of fires in our area and it doesn't feel feasible for us, you know, aging women to be able to look after such a property, like in the long term, that's just too much. So that was one reason. And the other reason was also that we didn't really attract lots of people who wanted to train. And, you know, that has probably something to do with the fact that we left the Archon Char lineage when we became Bikunis in 2011. And uh, so, you know, our whole uh, plan hasn't really worked out in the manner it was uh, originally thought, but uh, that's okay. And now I'm starting with what's called the Aloka Earth Room, which is a, a small space in, in uh, San Rafael, which I'm cu currently, you know, developing. And I think in the spring, it's going to be ready, you know, to open its doors. And these days, you know, I'm mostly interested really to use the Buddhist teaching to meet the challenges of our time, you know, this interlocking crisis, which we all kind of can pay witness wherever we look, so much is going on, so much uncertainty. And, you know, I think, you know, to have a 
grounded and strong spiritual practice is now more important than ever before, I think. And, I, and my approach is to you know, use the early Buddhist teaching as a as a grounding, as an anchoring from which to be, you know, creative and try to really uh, bring this teaching into into the present moment, you know, and into the contemporary challenges. And every year, you know, when we invited here at the San Francisco Dharma Collective, we just choose a theme which we, you know, use as a as a inspiration to go through the year. And this year we chose Ayan Anabodhi and myself, we chose the theme of Dharma, the Supreme Medicine. And sometimes Ayan Anabodhi is coming and sometimes myself coming here to teach in person. And once in a while, it's also only online if we can't make it. I think there's such an occasion in March. And uh, yeah, and I've just, you know, read again, what did we write on the on the internet, on the blurb? It's called Dhamma, the Supreme Medicine. Finding healing in the midst of great challenges is the alchemy that arises from turning towards difficulties. The world gives us endless opportunities, while the Dhamma is a timeless medicine that transforms us. So that's kind of the working theme. And... You know, for me in particular with the earth room, you know, one of the questions, you know, which I find most pertinent at this time is, you know, how are we going to meet the fact that, you know, this planet on which we live is uh, approaching carrying maximum carrying capacity, you know, and it looks like the way how we are living is just not sustainable. And I think more and more people start to kind of get a feeling that this is really true and all of the kind of responses, emotional responses, which kick in, you know, first is probably numbness and, and kind of disbelief. But then if we can stay with that, you know, and slowly allow it to sink in, probably transforms into some kind of anxiety and, and maybe anger and, and all other, you know, kind of difficult emotions which we really need to fully meet if we want to set free that energy which is needed in order to kind of, uh, you know, make make a connection with our particular response, you know, which is the right response for us. And, um, you know, these deep changes which we, if we want to stay on this planet as a species, we have to undergo very deep changes in the ways we are relating to what's happening. And uh, because, you know, what we need to do is we need to do some very uh, kind of big um, adjustments, you know, on a material level as well as on a, on a mental level you know, which have a lot to do, which are dictated basically by the limits of, of the biosphere on this on this planet. And that's just part of what it is to be a human being at this time. And, you know, when, when the scriptures were written down, you know, like about 500 years after the Buddha's passing away, so like 500 years after the Buddha's passing away was about the, you know, the beginning of, of the Christian uh, way of, of the calendar, you know, that at that time there was no, no such things, you know, on the horizon for, for most people. The scriptures, they do speak about, you know, those cycles of, of like arising world systems and then world systems ceasing again and arising anew, but people hadn't really touched that in, in, in their direct experience. But I think we are in the position now that we get just kind of a whiff of that, that this might be really true. And uh, and that's also why I call the place which I'm now uh, developing in San Rafael, that's why I call it the Aloka Earth Room. Aloka means clarity. And, you know, to have to gain some, or not gaining, 
to cultivate clarity around those questions, you know, that how, how ecology and, you know, looking after one's living space is just like part of the deal of being a human being. We are just not here, you know, like little children who are kind of just benefiting from a big mother and have no responsibilities towards her. That just is not the case and never has been the case. But now it becomes just very obvious. And I have looked up, you know, the word ecology, the definition of this is a branch of biology that deals with the relations of organisms to one another and to their physical surroundings. And oikos, that's the root of the word eco, means house in Greek. So, you know, taking an interest in, in, in one's house, basically. And, and really understanding that we are not separate from that house, but that we are like in constant exchange with it. And that we are not really private entities, you know, which are separate, but we are, we are like the apples on, on a tree. I've heard that yesterday, somebody said that, you know, we are the apples and, and the planet is the tree. And if we fall, you know, from the, from the branch, then we go back into the earth and, and be integrated again into that tree. And we have never been living in a different way. We just weren't aware of that fact. And that, you know, that uh, concept of not, not self, uh, anatta, which is, you know, the central insight in the Buddhist teaching or emptiness, it's called in the later schools of Buddhism, that encapsulates all of that already, you know, in Iron Age India, basically, the Buddha spoke about that. And that was the, you know, the new uh, insight the Buddha brought when he started to teach after his enlightenment. So, you know, so the teaching is around for a very long time, but still, you know, we are now in this, this extreme um, corner, you know, in terms of we have developed systems of living on this planet, which are not sustainable. And, and it feels like, you know, that there will be a long way of that there is enough uh, interest and and enough skill, you know, for us to turn it around. Because we, we might have the technological uh, know-how, but we but what it is about, you know, the relationships, how we can organize ourselves, how we can work together, how we can make decisions together and implement what needs to be implemented. That's the difficult bit and always has been, you know, the, the human element is the difficult piece. And uh, so the question is, you know, how can we use this teaching of the Buddha so that we can become part of the solution, that we can, uh, you know, become, you know, the immune system of the earth, how it's sometimes called, you know, that those of us who can uh, hear the need and who are willing to really kind of uh, train themselves so that they can uh, be more open towards that which needs to come through some of us and as many as possible if we want to stay around. You know, but it said it, it is less than 10% of, of the, um, of, 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 of people in a system need to understand that need. And then it would, from there, it would penetrate, you know, into the mainstream. And in order, you know, to understand those things, we don't need to necessarily learn more, but it's more, you know, we need to remove all of that which stands in the way so that we can connect with that wisdom and compassion, which we can uh, connect with if we sensitize our hearts and our minds in a way so that they can perceive that, you know, which is emerging as we go along. And, and, and the, 
according to my understanding, you know, the Buddhist teaching is basically a toolbox which gives us different tools in order to train our hearts and our minds so that all of that which stands in the way is shaved off as we go along. And, uh, you know, the main tools are the, the four establishments of mindfulness, the four satipatthana, and the four Brahma Viharas, the, the four divine abidings. So those two sets of fours, you know, are there for us to help us to, to train our hearts and our minds. The four Satipatthana more in the sense of, you know, training the mind so that the mind is capable of insight into the three characteristics, impermanence, uh, unsatisfactoriness and not self or emptiness and, and the four Brahma Viharas, this more the cool practices we can say, and the four Brahma Viharas, the warm practices which are geared more towards opening the mind really wide and embracing and giving space to what is here. And those two sides, you know, of the practice, they work together. And, uh, you know, they are enabling the mind and the heart increasingly to have real intimate relationship with, with experience and not kind of just projecting our stories on top of it, but having the capacity to really open open to what's happening and open to emergence, really. Knowing, you know, that there is no going back to normal, how it was before or anything like that, because it doesn't really exist. But, you know, there's a constant uh, flow happening, a constant, um, it's a process. And, and, you know, the less grasping we apply in the midst of this process, the less uh, suffering there will be. And the more grasping there is, the more friction there is, the more suffering. And uh, so this constant change, it can be experienced either as samsara or as nirvana, depending on how we relate to it. And so, you know, we can't do anything about that constant change. That's not the point, but it's, it's more the point is how do we relate to it? And the whole Buddhist teaching is all about that. It's all about learning how to relate to it in a way which, uh, you know, takes out the ego, basically learning to relate to all of this from from a complete from no standpoint really and uh, and honing the capacity for intimacy to really be really in contact with our experience and and that which is in the way, allowing that, you know, to be felt and that can feel very uncomfortable and frightening and scary and allowing that to be the teacher, really. And uh, so that intimacy with our experience, allowing that to be uh, a teacher for how to be in the world. And what, you know, what comes to mind the most is then that uncertainty because we never know what's going to emerge. And for example, Achan Cha, one of the forest masters of Thailand of the you know last century, he always spoke about maine, that means in Thai, not sure, not sure. You know, we don't know. Also with, with the whole uh, ecological crisis, we don't really know what's going to happen. Nobody knows. So if we kind of try to nail it all down and say, you know, we have lost the blood, it's all going to be completely terrible. We're all going to perish from the planet. That's nobody knows if that's really true. But to say, you know, that it, we don't need to do anything about it, that's also not true. But what can be done is, you know, we can really work with our minds and sensitize our minds to have more capacity to really relate to what's happening and then see what emerges from that. That's the only thing we can do that does, is there's no certainty in that. 
but that's exactly you know what we need to learn to be able to live a life even there is no certainty and uh, that's you know the hallmark of the teaching is to be able to do that and then when the anxiety and the fear and all of those things come up to do that work of you know feeling it just as it is and that is the polishing uh instrument you know the the feeling of it as it is and not defending against it that brings increasing clarity and strength into the process and one way you know how that can be expressed in the teaching is is through the seven factors of awakening the seven bochanga you know who are like one way how we can describe what is cultivated in the mind through meditation and the other Sati mindfulness, Dhamma Vichaya, interest, uh, energy, virya, pity, joy, or contentment, pasadi, calm, samadhi, collectedness, or focus, and upeka, uh, which is uh, equipoise. So those seven factors of awakening, you know, they need to be polished, they need to be developed, they need to be trained with these different tools, you know, in the with the four Satipatthana and the four Brahma Viharas and all the other tools which are there. And then things are starting to fall away. And when things are starting to fall away, then there's more and more capacity to have to stay really in relationship with our experience. And from that being in, in real relationship, then, you know, the ways how to go forward will emerge from that. And uh, so that's the plan, you know, for this, um, for this series of, of, of uh, talks with Ayananda Bodhi and I will give over the next months to come. And and it's all based, you know, on, on certain agreements, you know, that practice, with, for example, the what's called the five precepts. And uh, and also if if people are so inclined, you know, the three refuges. So they are like basically the the launching pad, you know, for that undertaking of training the mind, because they give like a certain, you know template from which to start to engage in this work because all of the strong emotions you know which can be kicked up it's very good you know to have have a framework to bump against so we know hey you know pay attention to this so usually and you know, i always give the the precepts in the beginning but today i got a little bit carried away and I'm giving them now <laughs> instead. So do you screen share that in or what? Vicky? Okay. So is there anyone, you know, before I, I start with this, is there anyone who doesn't know what that is, the three refuges in the five precepts? Because I think you shouldn't take them if you don't know what you're doing. Okay. And also, if you can't keep all of them, you know, then you can also take four. That's fine. It's better than none, you know. But don't take one you already know you're going to break it when you get out the door. <laughs> I think it's better. Okay, so for people who are here, do, well, how, what do they do? Do you have? Should they just look on the, on the screen? Uh, yeah. If anybody, you know, would like to take it, and doesn't know, you could look on the screen, yeah. So, you know, we can just start with Namo Tassa. We can chant it together. And then we can do the refugees like call and response. And, and then the precepts, I read them in English. And then afterwards, people can read them in English. Okay. All right. <clears throat> So is there no questions about that? Doesn't look like, huh? Good. 
Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma samputasa. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma samputasa. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma samputasa. And now we can do call and response, okay? Bhutang Sarananga Chami. Tamang Sarananga Chami. Sankang Sarananga Chami. Dutiampi putang sarananga chami. Dutiampi tamang sarananga chami. Dutiampi tutiampi sankang sarananga chami. Dati empi putang sarananga chami. Dati empi tamang sarananga chami. Dati ampi sankang sarananga chami. Dati ampi sankang sarananga chami. Dati ampi sankang sarananga chami. And now the five precepts. I undertake the precept to refrain from taking the life of any living creature. I undertake the precept to refrain from taking that which is not given. I undertake the precept to refrain from sexual misconduct. I undertake the precept to refrain from false and harmful speech. I undertake the precept to refrain from consuming intoxicating drink and drugs, which lead to carelessness. Okay. So, you know, just I brought a, a short sutta today from the Samyutta Nikaya. And it's it's a very well known sutta about you know how can we go about you know working together in you know in a time where probably a lot of emotions are gonna be triggered and and I just really like that sutta very much and it's it's short. And it's called Sedaka. I think that's a that's a, a a town. And if you have never heard the suttas, you know, read so it's, it's a bit of an old language, but I think it's not difficult to understand. Sedaka. So this is in the chapter 47 in the Samyutta Nikaya, the connected sayings. On one occasion, the Blessed One was dwelling among the Sumbas, where there was a town of the Sumbas named Sedaka. There the Blessed One addressed the monastics thus. Monastics, once in the past, an acrobat set up his bamboo pole and addressed his apprentice thus. Come, dear apprentice, climb the bamboo pole and stand on my shoulders. Having replied, yes, teacher, the apprentice climbed up the bamboo pole and stood on the teacher's shoulders. The acrobat then said to the apprentice, you protect me, dear apprentice, and I protect you. 
task guarded by one another, protected by one another. We will display our skills, collect our fee and get down safely from the bamboo pole. When this was said, the apprentice replied, that's not the way to do it, teacher. You protect yourself, teacher, and I protect myself. Thus, each self-guarded and self-protected, we will display our skills, collect our fee, and get down safely from the bamboo bowl. That's the method there, the Blessed One said. It's just as the apprentice said to the teacher. I will protect myself, monastics, thus should the establishments of mindfulness be practiced. That's the Satipatthanas. I will protect others, monastics, thus should the establishments of mindfulness be practiced. Protecting oneself, monastics, one protects others. Protecting others, one protects oneself. And how is it, uh, monastics, that by protecting oneself, one protects others? by the pursuit, development, and cultivation of the four establishments of mindfulness. It is in such a way that by protecting oneself, one protects others. And how is it, monastics, that by protecting others, one protects oneself? By patience, harmlessness, loving kindness, and sympathy. That's the four, that's the Brahma Viharas. It is in such a way that by protecting others, one protects oneself. I will protect myself, monastics. Thus should the establishments of mindfulness be practiced. I will protect others, monastics. Thus should the establishment of mindfulness be practiced. Protecting oneself, one protects others. Protecting others, one protects oneself. So I think that's a very kind of powerful... Uh, and clear teaching, you know, that if we really understand, you know, how we are, how we think internally and, and live from that place, we protect ourselves. And in that sense, we are also, you know, safe for others. And that's also, for example, you know, that's why the five precepts are considered to be you know, giving the gift of fearlessness to the world. It's a great, you know, we are protecting ourselves to not, you know, do unwholesome, unskillful action by body, speech, and mind as good as we can. And in that way, we also protect others. And I think that's a, you know, a very um, integrated way of of seeing one's practice, it's not, it's never only just for ourselves, you know, it's always in deep interconnection with everything around us because we are no separate beings. We are basically, you know, our bodies are sacred land or our bodies are not private land, you know, but we are in constant exchange like apples on an apple tree. And, and I think if we, learn you know that our mind can can get more intimate and more connected with that way of seeing and experiencing ourselves that this will uh, be the method you know how we can link into emergence you know into that which wants to come through you know, out of emptiness or out of Prajnaparamita Kunin, God, Dhammakaya, emptiness, silence, however we want to call it, it doesn't really matter. But that which is emerging, you know, that which wants to come through because there's so many things dying right now. And, You know, and we can't really kind of pull on, on the emptiness to give us her secrets, but but we can clean, if you want to say clean, maybe it's a bit too dualistic, but we can make space, you know, we can open ourselves. That's We can get ready, we can prepare for that. We can put down luggage, we can, uh, you know, align ourselves more and more. And and also through prayer and through aspiration, intention, we can, there's a lot of, um, 
you know, there's a lot of um, power we have in order to align ourselves or not. And and it's it's not you know it's not a linear process. And it I think it needs uh, what is very important is is to have to do that together with others. You know who have who have a similar kind of mind and who have the similar intentions and to meet on a regular basis and to discuss, you know, what comes up and, and to have that um, support, you know, because otherwise one can feel pretty uh, isolated sometimes about all of this. And, you know, and, then, and I hope that with this series, we can provide a little bit of that and, once the Aloka Earthroom opens its doors sometimes in the spring, I'd like to really focus on that, you know, to, to develop a, a healing space, you know, where that can be in the center of the, of the space and where the space itself expresses that intention. And, uh, yeah, because what else is there to do? Because it's all uncertain, you know. And if we're just going to despair and think it's all not working out, that's just like another fixation, you know, which can be for a moment a relief, you know, because at least we know it's not working. But we, nobody can ever know what's going to happen, even in one minute. And that's that's really good to remember that. And not to be too sure, you know, about anything. Other than the, maybe the five precepts, you know, they they are a cosmic law, I think, you know, we can be certain that they are very sober and, and, and good guidelines, but most everything else, we don't know. So... Maybe you can take some time, you know, for a guided meditation now. And just find a, a posture you can sustain for like 30 minutes. And you're just you know connecting with uh, the mind and just looking where are you right now? And then the emotions I have here the heart area maybe, and then coming to the body as it's sitting and breathing in and breathing out. Just, yeah, we are in very special time right now of great transition where, you know, certain systems are clearly, you know, hitting the limits of what they can accommodate. And then that's, it's time for, for big changes. And then there's often, you know, starts, there's a crisis. Things go into some amount of chaos before they can reshuffle themselves. And if you don't know what to do, then it's always good to slow down.
Times are urgent, we need to slow down. I'm just simply, you know, taking in the stress level right now for you between one and 10, what is there? Just letting that emerge. And just giving it the space it needs. There's nothing wrong about that. This is just what it is. And then, you know, with the impress, really allowing the experience to really come close to whatever it is. And with the outbreath, just relaxing into the spaciousness of this room. You know, which doesn't end at the walls of this room, but the spaciousness, the silence is limitless. Times are urgent, we need to slow down. And you're just becoming aware maybe of the hardness of the chair, the earth element, you know, which is uh, also in our bone structure, teeth, fingernails, and the whole planet on which, you know, this city is uh, rooted on. And the soil underneath this building, you know, which is consists of many, many beings who have died, plant beings and animal beings and human beings, and they are forming this layer of soil, which is also you know, producing food and other plants. So we are, you know, in intimately entangled with all of this. And constantly in process. So, you know, our situation now is 
it's just part of nature also. It's not like that we are imposing something onto nature, but we are nature and this is what's happening. How can we learn to relate to this in a more responsible and intimate way? That is the question. And how can we also carry those ancient wisdom teachings into this space right now? Because they need some, they need to be infused with different parlance, different verbiage in order to be able to really cut it, what's happening right now on a conventional level. Because a lot of the Buddhist teaching is stuck deeply in patriarchy. And that's really weakens it, actually. So with the in-breath and really allowing the confusion, the not knowing, the uncertainty, the mess, all of it, letting it just be there. And with the out just letting go into the um, spaciousness and the silence. And then just, you know, letting, maybe letting go of the body and, and becoming aware more of the silence and the spaciousness, which doesn't end at the walls of this room. And, you know, listening into the silence, listening into the space, which means, you know, opening the mind. And whenever the mind wants to contract around a thought, a story, a concept, just gently bring it back to the spaciousness and the silence. And for now, not allowing that contraction to stay. And I rather noticing, you know, the need of the mind to land somewhere. And weaning it off that need, which is comes from fear. And then, you know, listening into the silence, which is behind the sound of the hitting, which is, you know, the silence out of which all sounds emerge.
to this uh, unlimited space, immeasurable space. And then, you know, letting go of the spaciousness and of the silence and turning towards that which knows the space and the silence. So it's like making a U-turn and conscious awareness, being aware of that which knows about the silence, which knows about the space. And not, you know, now going into thinking, just allowing the mind to respond and in the beginning, you know, if the mind hasn't been coaxed in that way, it might just be very confused. Let it be confused. It's okay. It's a training. So becoming aware of that which knows about the spaciousness and the silence, the conscious awareness, or in the Thai forest tradition is called Puru, or in the Sokchen tradition is called Rikpa. And if there, you know, is left some notion of ego behind it, dropping that as well, it's just being that knowing. And it's not a thing, but that is being the knowing. It's not a frozen state, it's a it's being, being the knowing or conscious awareness. It's like a mirror which reflects what's going on, the hearing of the traffic and the heating, the pressure of the body on the seat, the wetness of the mouth, the breathing, it's all effortless known, like a mirror reflecting what, what comes before it. There's nothing which needs to be done, but that can be made conscious, that which cannot be named in the end. There's no need, but there's, you know, different fingers pointing at the moon and not getting stuck on those, but they all have a limited shelf life. Until they've done the job, they can just be discarded. So that's the refuge of Buddha, which we have been reciting in the beginning. That awareness, conscious awareness. Which we can forget, but when we remember it, it's already there. And then, you know, noticing the subtle joy which comes with that resting as awareness, sense of contentment. And that's important to pay attention to that subtle joy. And it's an acquired taste which the mind needs to be shown so it can find its way back quite easily
and you know, and abiding in that conscious awareness, that is really one way how the mind can be sensitized and trained to abide in that subtle mode of being. So that's, for example, it's a very good example of completely, you know, losing oneself in oneself, you know, in the in the thoughts and in the feelings, which is totally age appropriate. And then, you know, through the training, we can become the witness of that, even when it happens in ourselves, you know, that we throw a tantrum, but we don't necessarily need to blurt it out if we have trained ourselves. Then if we can manage that, you know, the resilience will be trained will become stronger.
And then, you know, for the remainder of the meditation, we just can come back into you know, the body and becoming aware of the breathing, of the impermanence of the, the breathing process. And even a, you know, very subtle meditation can come to an end. It's just, you know, an impermanent state. And even there was maybe a temporary, a temporary uh, calming of the hindrances. Uh, sometimes you know, called temporary liberation of the mind. A sample, a taste of how it can be. You know, if the mind is permanently free from the hindrances. fully awakened, but even this, you know, temporary taste is very helpful because it gives us the confidence that we know we're going in the right direction with all of this. And the, you know, the confidence in impermanence also, that is just part of the picture. And we can trust it. And, you know, allow ourselves a full, complete contact with our experience because it is impermanent. that intimacy with our own experience, which is the way how we learn, how we develop wisdom and compassion and <clears throat> how we can um, lean into emergence. And using this ancient teaching, which comes from Iron Age India, but in its essence is timeless, but in its particular expressions and verbiage and rituals and other areas needs to be adjusted to now.
So we can, you know, have some some Q and A or comments. And if you on the Zoom would like to pose a question, then you will you will uh, take care of me. Yes, and then I tell you, and then you or you look. Okay, okay. Where's Vicky? Who is Vicky? Hello. Hi. Oh, hi. you are the one. Okay. Hi. Thank you. Hi. Okay. You have it all under control. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. So please, maybe I can answer some questions if I can. Now, well, let's see. Yeah. Keep it simple, you know, so that others can also understand. When you want to speak more about what we spoke before? Oh, sure. Mm -hmm. It feels like one of the edges of my practice is the sense of there being a center or a location of awareness. Mm -hmm. And it kind of feels like that's one of the aspects of clinging to self. I'm just curious of any comments on how to further explore that. Like I, I do the pasana in terms of looking at that feeling and it's, it's not static, but it feels like a resonance. Like there's kind of a, a hovering sensation around here where it's like, it feels like, I don't know if awareness is denser there. That's not it, but it feels like there is like, that's kind of like the center of awareness and everything else is happening around it. Yeah. I think, you know, you can't just whenever that kind of really becomes strong, you can just like consciously drop it. You know, I think just letting it go and, 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 uh, I don't think it needs to be a problem. You know what I mean? Because I think that this is just the nature of, of, uh, how, how we are, you know, how we are, because we, we do sit somehow in the center of our own universe, you know, but not really, but conventionally speaking, it is like that with the body and so on. So I don't think it needs to be a, pro a problem, you know, because this is then again, maybe thinking, you know, why don't you just sit with that, um, You know, because there's maybe a certain amount of confusion there, you know, is it the right thing? And there's doubt, right? So I think I would rather look at the doubt, you know, which is an expression of ego also. It's, a, it's one of the hindrances. I think that's what, what comes to mind for me, you know. That uh, I think, you know, there are very deep, deep states of meditation, like the, the chanas, the absorptions. I think where that, resolves itself but i don't think that's the only avenue you know to go but you can also you know in the way how i was guiding us before with coming you know opening the mind and coming to, you know the silence the spaciousness and then becoming aware of that which knows about the silence and the spaciousness then dropping any notions of ego or self which attach themselves to that and resting in that that's the way how I, I how i practice and i think you know as long as you're not practicing like deep absorption there will always be that remnant you know but i think over time through the practice through being more fully confident in it it goes away Yeah, that's very helpful. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. What's your name? I'm Ruben. 
Rubin. Uh -huh. Okay. With whom did you made a practice before, or that you? What have I done? Uh, which where did you learn the, the, the practice? Too many places. Okay. I'm really inspired by the Thai forest tradition, but also the Grenadian teachings. Mm -hmm. I was at Temple Monastery for about two months, which is okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh huh. Interesting. A lot of different influences and features. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. A good question. Yeah. Any anybody else? Yes, Joseph. This isn't so much for me, but I just am curious um, how how you grapple with those who say it's too late for the environment. We've already crossed that. Yeah. I think you know how can I mean nobody knows, you know, that's just like it's just I, I I don't grapple with them. I just think, you know, I, I don't believe that, but I also don't know if it's not too late. And and I think, you know, that the, that doesn't change much about what what I feel what I feel needs to be done, you know, because action is it's it's an antidote, you know, to kind of freaking out completely. Anyway, you know, if it works out or not works out is is kind of not really the question this is what i would say you know and but i also understand you know that some people would think that but it, it's just like nobody can know nobody can know and uh Heda and i you know we did we did yesterday we were taking part in a teaching of Adi Ashanti. there were about 650 people about it was you know spiritual practice and climate change and um and they did a poll at the beginning, you know, like with from it's not happening to it's too late. And most people were exactly in the middle, you know, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, it was like 50%. Yeah. yeah. What did we say? Three or 7%? That thought it was too late. Uh -huh. And then. And 3% who thought it was 1%. Percent wasn't happening yeah at all. yeah wow. yeah i think you know that I, I think that way of of saying you know has a lot to do also with once it brings out like very deep early childhood conditioning i think and isn't really because nobody can know you know yeah <laughs> I just had this experience and I, I can't remember because I'm starting to get old. And so it was either late in high school or early in college. I was taking a biology class and I remember the teacher or professor, depending on yeah. what point it was. I just remember what he said. I don't remember which yeah. environment it was in. And he said, the earth will continue on. Humanity. Yeah, yeah maybe not. But yeah. there'll be some form of something and the earth will continue. And it's kind of strange because I was like, kind of like, I, that kind of made me feel okay a tiny bit about it, not to go out and be reckless. Yeah. We still should try. Mm -hmm. Like you're saying, we shouldn't give up you yeah. know, just because it, if even if it is too late. But I, I don't know, that felt okay to me when he said that. I was like, oh, but the thing is, you know, the point is that we are not even different from the earth. That That's, that's true. Yeah. You know, and that's a more, a more recent understanding i think which emerges into the in you know into the into homo sapiens or into the mainstream that actually you know we are different from it because we are in constant exchange and our bodies are just part of the planet like the apples you know on the tree and and then you know it makes it a whole different board game because it isn't like that we have done something bad you know we need to be punished for and now we need to work hard to make it go away it's more like hey you know this is part of a much vaster process you know or a vaster intelligence than we could ever fathom you know with those little minds of ours and why don't we make a more intimate connection with that process so we can be part of it more fully you know that because that's what what I think, you know, and 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 I think that's what the crisis is, you know, what the crisis is kind of waking me up to as a response, 
is I don't feel like I'm a perpetrator who has done everything wrong, you know, but I'm more feeling, you know, I'd like to go deeper because it's my, it's my birthright, you know, as being part of the planet is to kind of connect more deeper with that innate intelligence, you know, mm. and, and because, you know, we are all deeply influenced by, by the kind of Christian conditioning of, you know, we've done it wrong and now we have to do it right. And all of it brings us up so much of those unquestioned concepts, you know, within which we are operating, which are all about separation, you know, and right and wrong and all of that. So there is just, I think there's so much going on in an evolutionary manner, you know, through the pressure of that situation which is the way it is you know and 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 i think we can't just like flee into a teaching from nh india like in these big books we have to really marry it with with the current situation you know and that i find that incredibly interesting actually and and without the pressure you know from outside because there is is nowhere to go anymore. It just either you kill yourself or you go down and you go deeper. And I rather go deeper than try to run into the wall, you know, because there is no more of going anywhere because it's all gotten so small, you know. So I would then try to communicate that somehow to those people, you know, if if they want to hear it and if if not then i just keep shut up kind of a thing yeah we've got a couple of questions online i've got damon and then victoria and then suzanne hi hi thank you um so this is my first time here on um, this morning i heard uh at i i zoomed into uh insight uh la la yeah. insight yeah and um wendy block gave a talk about uh clinging and um so it was exciting to hear her talk about uh dropping the clinging to self um you know we are not our our self we're not our thoughts we're not our feelings um but uh I do like my, I do like my 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 Jewish Christian training about uh, conditioning to um, to put put others before myself. So I do I do want to keep that, but so how can my losing my clinging to self help me to continue? Um, in my in my path towards putting others first. I mean, why don't you try try out and find out for yourself? I, I can't well, really tell. Well, I'm asking I'm asking you to just if you could. I would welcome any comments that you have, because I know you have a tradition of of bodhisattva, which is very similar to, um, you know, the Christian ideal of of Jesus um, dying to self. Mm -hmm. so i i'm sure there's some yeah go ahead thank you i think you know, the central inside of, of the buddhist teaching is the insight into not self or emptiness you know that all uh all beings including human beings don't exist from their own side you know but they are like processes which are like interconnected with everything else so that's considered to be the way things truly are and then you know you can't really put others in before yourself because others don't have are not self as much as you are not self you know so i think that insight into not self would you know would kind of uh if it's really kind of cultivated the fruit would be is wisdom and compassion and then from that wisdom and compassion you act you speak you live you think 
And then, uh, you know, sometimes you would put others in front of yourself and sometimes you would not, depending on what is appropriate in order to, you know, um, grow in, in wisdom and compassion. And that can be sometimes quite fierce and sometimes very gentle. And, and that is, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a, it's a, like, uh, an emergent response. And to have mm. like like a, a kind of a guideline and say you must always put others in front of yourself. That's it's a bit too clunky, you know, for really working well. Because you know, you would say to do like a powerful white CEO, you would say do that, but do like a, a African American poor woman, you would maybe say to the opposite, you know. Yeah. Depending, you know, yeah. where you what's your social situation, mm. where where's your location, and then where you are in in the whole net of things. Mm -hmm. It's a good idea, you know, of course, but it's a little bit um, clunky. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I just I I just want to say that uh, I I also heard a talk by Ajahn Sumado. Uh, yeah, yeah, who said that this identity of I am African American, I am white, I am a woman, actually is a kind of uh, obstacle uh, to realizing, uh, you know, that uh, I am not, I am, I am, there's no self. So you start to layer it with uh, I am this uh, type of person, I am, I am woman, I am man, then you're already starting to get relativist, actually. Yeah. I mean, you know, Archon Sumedo is a very privileged, right? Amazingly privileged man, you know, who I lived with for 16 years. And yeah, he is right, ultimately, but conventionally, there's a vast difference, you know. Okay. And both, both needs to be spoken to, you know. Oh. Both needs to be spoken to. And this is one of the big issues in Buddhism, you know, all of those big white or Asian guys, you know, sitting on the throne and speaking down onto the audience. I have a problem with some of that. Even okay. I have also a lot of gratitude for the teaching and the support I have received, but it's a mixed bag, you know. Amen. Thank That's you. how I ended up here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we have only five thank more minutes you. or maybe a little bit more. So thank you so much. Yeah. Uh then who is I can't read? Victoria. Victoria, hi. Hi, thank you for this beautiful session with you. Um I'm an artist, uh, well, I'm a musician and an art historian, and I've dedicated my whole education and life basically to the arts. And I know that um that's in your past as well. And lately I've been trying to, um, I'm very interested in your, your project um, in San Rafael. I'm wondering um, if there's, if there's like a, a bigger, um, like a Sangha that's where, where people who have a background in the arts and who are still working professionally in the arts um, can, um, can, converse about ways to sort of bring more awareness to our our um, earth situation and the climate and in other words bring bring their arts in service to some of the global crises um within like from a buddhist framework if if there's mm -hmm. some kind of larger sangha out there because i haven't found one um, yeah, I think not yet, well, but that is something I'm interested in, you know, once my place is up and running. Where do you live? I'm in Southern California. Um, okay. And so, but I'm I'm looking with great uh, anticipation at what, at your um, yeah. work. And, um, and I have a daughter who's in Portland, Oregon, who's also very interested. She's a choreographer and a filmmaker and... Um, okay. So we're yeah, maybe you know, once I'm, I'm like, I think in the spring or so, you know, I might be getting there because I'm still, 
uh, in the process and I, I just closed the monastery in the Sierra foothills and I'm still recovering from endless work. But I think by around, my plan is around the International Earth Day to be finished with it. And maybe then you we can uh, you you can write to me on email and uh, you can visit our website and contact me and then maybe we can meet in uh, in some way or another. I would be very interested. Yes. Oh, wonderful! Because, okay. Yeah, because I think art is a very powerful uh, means of communication. You know, which bypasses the dualistic mind often and has a capacity. You know, which needs to be tapped. And my first teacher, Archan Buddha Dasa, who was a Thai forest monk, did that already 50 years ago. And it's basically based on his work that I try to make an update of that approach. That's yes. Wonderful. Well, thank you. And I look thank forward you. to that. Yes, I think we already spoke once, didn't we? Like some time ago, we, we did actually here at another one of these Sunday yeah. meetings. But um, but it, you you were still in transition, <laughs> so yes. I just wondered. I wondered if the community, um, if you had found a community in the meantime that was more globally, um, so we can all share ideas and support each other. I mean, yeah, I work with different cohorts, like of teachers in that direction, but. It's not, you know, there is one group which is called people, uh, yeah, but there's no no real group yet, you know, dedicated to that. But that would be something I'm really interested in. So let's see. Great. Okay. Thank you. Yes. I, I'm very interested, you know, in sacred art, which is really based on, on a sound practice, not just like I have made like one retreat and now I'm going to put that into my resume, but it's more like, yeah, real deep practice. Yeah. Yeah. Let's, let's, your name is Victoria. Victoria Martino. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. I have then, a website too. So if you want to connect with me. <laughs> yes. Yes. Okay. Thank yeah. you so much. I'm looking uh -huh. forward. Uh -huh. Maybe, um, do you know my, my website? <laughs> Maybe uh, can you type it in my website into the chat? Well, I can type it in. Yeah. Or maybe if you give it to Heather, she can type it in. And Suzanne, last question. Um, thanks, Ayla. In the interest, yeah. of, the interest of time, um, I'm yes. just, yeah, yeah, I just wanted to say, well, firstly, thank you so much. And secondly, um, you know, I think this pandemic, as difficult as it has been and continues to be, um, I think it's been a great teaching. And I think it has helped us to wake up. Um, we're not in charge. We never will be in charge. And, um, and I, think, I think it has caused us to be humble. And, and I'm wondering if you think that that are also part of the mix of what this is about. Yeah, you know? I think so. Totally. Yeah. 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 It's beautiful and when you think that, you know, the church bells here are ringing very sweetly. Can you hear them? That's the Angelus. Because it's yeah, six, say, yeah, it is part yeah, of yeah. it. It's, it's all part of that. Yeah, yeah. Yes, I I think so. Yeah. And thank you so much for doing this work. And please be in touch with what you need. Yes, and thank I'll you. See what I can yes. do. Thanks. Thank thanks, you Sarah. for. You know, Susan. Thank you for the book and the pillows. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. And Victoria, I think uh, the, in the chat is now the website address. You can just click on the contact form and write me an email. All right. Thank you. So thank you everyone for coming. And I'm going to be here again next month. And I'm going to bring a, another Pikuni with me. I have Imala from Belgium. So hope to see you then. Thank you so much. <laughs>